how sweet the sound the same the rich like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my Savior has ransomed me And like a flood His mercy reigns Unending love Amazing grace The Lord has promised good to me His word my hope secures He will my shield and portion be As long as life endures The earth shall soon dissolve like snow The sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed reading from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. 
in him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark, chapter 6, beginning at verse 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah, and others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his, brother, his brother's Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed. And yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she was pleased, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask, I will give you even half of my kingdom she went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guards with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. O oh Christ. The Gospel reading we heard today was from the Gospel of Mark, and Mark's the set lectionary gospel for some weeks now. And it's a really good gospel to read through. Week by week we get a particular section, but I wonder how much we understand about how it fits together, how the particular bit works within the gospel as a whole. It's the shortest and the oldest of the gospels, written between 55 and 65 AD. And although it's the shortest, it covers the most events. It's action-packed. The passion is at the very heart of the gospel, making very clear to the reader the path of suffering Jesus trod to the cross. Some commentators have called it a gospel of the passion from beginning to end. So why do we read the gospels? to understand who Jesus is and how we can follow, how we can be disciples. So what does the Gospel of Mark tell us about who Jesus is? Well, in eight, chapter eight, verse 27, we have Peter's confession, you are the Christ. And that's a key turning point in the Gospel. In the first eight chapters, we're told about many miraculous events and healings performed by Jesus, and yet the true identity of Jesus is veiled. 
So in chapter one, we're told he healed many, drove out many evil spirits, but would not let the evil spirits say who he was. Then there's the man with leprosy healed and given a stern warning, don't tell anyone. And Jairus' daughter, Jesus commands the girl to get up and then gives strict orders not to let anyone know. Many times the question as to who Jesus is, is raised. Who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? It's in chapter five, verse 12. By chapter six, Jesus's name had become well known and there was much speculation as to who he was. Some said he was John the Baptist raised from the dead, some Elijah, some a prophet. So why so elusive? Well, the first half, the first eight chapters of Mark, recount many miracles and healings that demonstrate the power of Jesus, perhaps more in keeping with the kind of saviour the Jews were expecting, but most definitely not the full picture of who Jesus is. I think Mark wants to stop us from jumping to premature evaluations about who Jesus is. In Mark's view, Jesus cannot be adequately understood apart from his suffering and death. As De English puts it, so the demonstration of power in the first half of the gospel and the lonely path to the cross in the second are part of the one process of doing the will of his father, part of the one way of being who he is. It could be said that Mark's portrayal of the disciples is often quite harsh he certainly doesn't gloss over their failures, doubts, or their lack of understanding. Why? Well, I think that comes back to the centrality of the cross for Mark. Jesus cannot be properly understood without the cross. And I think Mark's rather unflattering portrayal at times of the disciples perhaps serves to encourage the reader, i.e. future disciples, you and me, as it makes clear that the road of discipleship is not an easy one, that failures and misunderstandings will occur. There are times we all doubt, make the wrong decision, act too impulsively. Yet I find it terribly reassuring that even the closest companions of Jesus didn't always get it right, yet they kept on with Jesus, seeking to follow him. It really is worth reading through the Gospel of Mark. It won't take you that long. And it will give you the big picture that we so often miss when we just look at particular sections. And it might even help you when you come across passages like the one we heard today, the beheading of John the Baptist. If we read this story on its own and out of context, we might think, well, what can we say? What do we do about that? Is it just a gruesome story? Well, yes, it is a pretty gruesome story. Sex, power, royalty, and religion, all within the one story. Herod had taken his brother's wife as his own. John the Baptist had spoken out against it, told Herod it wasn't right. So Herod had had him arrested and put in prison. The day of Herod's birthday and the royal party is underway. The wife's daughter came in and danced. Herod was pleased and offered the girl anything she asked in return. She consults her mother and then asks for the head of John the Baptist. We're told that the king is distraught, but nevertheless, he does as the girl asks. This story is a good example of why it helps to have an overall picture the big picture, the whole gospel. Remember I said that the passion is at the very heart of the gospel of Mark. The road of suffering that Jesus trod to the cross and the very clear message that the path of discipleship is not an easy one. In Mark's gospel, this story of John the Baptist's death comes before the passion predictions. Three times in this gospel, Mark tells his disciples what is coming. We call them the passion predictions. Of course, the disciples don't want to hear them. 
They don't want to hear that the Son of Man must suffer many things, that he must be killed, and after three days he will rise again. The beheading of John the Baptist comes first, almost a foretaste to the death of Jesus himself. Scholars are pretty much agreed that Mark wrote his gospel in the context of Christian communities that were facing hardships and being persecuted for their determination to stick to the gospel message, whatever the authorities might do. There is no final speech from John, dramatically declaring the message to all around. John is not given that opportunity, and yet Mark leaves the reader in no doubt that John was a righteous and holy man, and the kingdom of which he had spoken and the forgiveness he had offered were the reality that would win the day. Somehow I think this is a real message of hope, of hope and encouragement for the persecuted church, in fact, for all of us. Sometimes our particular part of the story doesn't go the way we want it to. Our faith doesn't protect us from pain, hardship, untimely, sometimes unjust, unjust and violent death. And yet, throughout his gospel, Mark makes it clear that this is only part of the story. That yes, the road of discipleship can indeed be hard, in John the Baptist's case, to the extreme. But this is not the end of the story. It is part of the bigger story, the story of the passion of Christ. It is the story that we share in each week together at the Eucharist. In that invitation to communion, every time we eat this bread or drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It is the story that we are invited to be part of. But as Mark makes quite clear, it is not an easy road. But as he also makes very clear, it is a story worth being part of. The letters or the epistles that were written to the early church explore in more depth what it might mean to be part of that story. And in today's reading from the letter of the Ephesians, it encapsulates something of that. Immediately, the letter plunges us into a cascade of beauty and riches, abundant blessing and glorious graces are lavished upon us for God's own good pleasure. This is no propitious whim of God, but purposefully planned before the foundation of the world. God has adopted us as his own children, made us to be his own people, and has given us an inheritance in Christ. God has chosen us to be holy and blameless in love, forgiven and redeemed through Christ. This is the excess of the language of worship. The words are an endless stream of praise and wonder, as if meant to lift us to the very heights of God's presence. The focus is on God's action. This is not our doing, it is all gift. In fact, these verses offer no obvious imperative at all, nothing for us to do, but love for the praise of his glory. In the words of the Westminster Catechism, our chief end is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. Mark's gospel does make clear that the road of discipleship is not easy, but it is most definitely a road worth travelling, that we, in the words of Paul, that we who were first, who first set our hope on Christ, might live to his praise and glory, that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live to his praise and glory. Amen. <laughs>